information, ladies and gentlemen, which I have just departed to you, was written by Alvin Boyd Pune, Ph.D., in his book entitled The Lost Light, An Interpretation of Ancient Scriptures. He was a theosophist. He was one of the most prolific writers and revealers of the esoteric religion. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. He was a member of the Order of Rosai Cruci and many others. He was a member of the Illuminati. He says it in his writings. All other Freemasons and members of the Brotherhood of Man who worship behind the veil in the lodges with no windows have all referenced Alvin Boyd Kuhn. They have written that he is one of the greatest of the thousand points of life. And indeed, he does not only speak for them, but he is the source of much of the knowledge that most of them possess. And so when Malleus Maleficarum said that he believed in God and he was a Christian, if you understand the definition of his terms and you agree with those terms, then yes, he does believe in God and he is a Christian. But make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, he does not believe in your God, nor does he believe in your Christ or your Christianity. Behind the veil. The thousand points of light. Do you really believe, ladies and gentlemen, that great men get up on platforms and make speeches and throw these terms and these words around? And when you question them, they say, oh, it's, it's just, you know, <laughs> we just threw it in there. Doesn't mean anything. Baloney. Every word that they use. Every word inserted in every speech has a great deal of meaning to someone and is placed there specifically to convey a message. When George Bush spoke of the New World Order and the thousand points of light, he was talking to his brothers, heralding the dawn of a new age, the new dawn, the age of Horus risen in a new world order. A world where the old religion is to be cast out. Where everything is to be cleansed and made anew in the image of the socialist utopian plan for the world. You see... If you would just go to your Bible and forget everything else that anyone ever wrote in that book and just read the words in red, you'll see that Jesus tried to tell you everything that I'm telling you tonight. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Seek ye the truth, and the truth will make you free. What is the new age? It's the age of Aquarius. <laughs> what is the age of Aquarius? It is symbolized by the water bearer. <clears throat> and that has tremendous significance. Now, <clears throat> I'm not telling you to read the Bible to become a Christian or to injure your sensibilities if you're not a Christian. What I'm telling you is there's a message there written in red that no matter who you are or what rigid, religion, religion, <laughs> some of them are rigid, or what religion you belong to, there is a message there that if you can see and if you can hear, <laughs> there's a lot of reference to that in there, 
And what that means is if you understand the symbolic, esoteric language so that you can read what is hidden below the literal interpretation and stop listening to these maniacs standing up behind pulpits telling you all these lies. Because that's what they are. Everyone is deceived, even the initiates and the mysteries. And Albert Pike admits it in Morals and Dogma. He says that at each level of initiation, they are presented with the same symbolic story, but each degree has a different interpretation. So what are they to believe? He says in Morals and Dogma, they never learn the truth until they reach the 30th degree when they are told that Lucifer is their God. And he doesn't mean that there is a red devil with horns and a pointed tail running around in some hellfire in the center of the earth poking people in the butt with a spear. It is a metaphor for even deeper esoteric revelations. Whether you believe them or not, you had better learn them, you had better study them because these people hold the reins of power. These are the people who control the atomic bombs, ladies and gentlemen. These are the people who built the Soviet Union. Now we'll continue. Because now we can talk about God in their language. And you can understand that it is not your God they are discussing. Do they believe that since man's spirit is an indestructible fragment of God's own mighty spirit, truly a tiny spark of that cosmic intelligence and love which we call the mind of God, the ancients typified the divine element in man by fire. Remember I told you that fire is the metaphor for the intellect. And in contrast, the lower are human element by water. The human element. And thus, great expanses of water represent large numbers of people. Souls occupying human or material bodies. The fiery soul of man is housed in a tenement of flesh and matter, which is seven-eighths water by actual composition. The crossing of rivers and seas and the immersion of solar heroes in water in olden mythologies and the rite of baptism in theology signified nothing beyond the fact of the soul's immersion in a physical body of water, nature, and its successive incarnations. You see, they believe in incarnation. They believe in past lives. Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz believes in past lives. He sent his son for past life regression. He talked about it on the air and said his son in his past life was a soldier just like him. He said that he believes in reincarnation. And in the same breath, out the other side of his mouth, he tells you he's a Christian. I've been telling you for years, James Bogreitz is an initiate, a warrior monk of the mysteries, a member of the Knights Templar. He is a Freemason and probably much more. They believe that man is distinctly a creature compounded of two natures, a higher and a lower, a spiritual and a sensual, a divine and a human, a mortal and an immortal, and finally a fiery and a watery conjoined in a mutual relationship in the organic body of flesh. And in the New Age movement, they take this literally and believe that the soul can actually leave the body and another soul come in and occupy it. They call these walk-ins. Heraclitus said, Man is a portion of cosmic fire imprisoned in a body of earth and water. And speaking of man, Plato said, Through body... It is an animal. Through intellect, it is a god. Everyone for hundreds and thousands of years have pondered the meaning of the Sphinx. And no one ever understood exactly what it meant until I told you on this broadcast. The Sphinx personifies this principle in the mysteries. 
the Sphinx obviously was built by one of the ancient lodges of the mystery religion of Babylon. The Sphinx, the Sphinx is put there to remind man that he is an animal who can think. An animal endowed with the fire of intellect. An animal within whose body dwells a soul. That is the mystery of the Sphinx. That is the only mystery of the Sphinx. That is the only message that the Sphinx can deliver. And I have never read it in any book, nor have I seen it spoken or written anywhere. It is what I have learned through the study of the mysteries. And I'm right. And the Brotherhood believes that this explanation is the truest basic description of man that anthropology can present. They believe that all problems spring from that foundation and are referable for solution back to it. They believe that man is then a natural man and a God. You see? In combination. They believe that our natural body gives the soul of man its baptism by water. Our nascent spiritual body is to give us the later baptism by fire. We are born first as the natural man, then as the spiritual. Or we are born first by water and then by fire. They believe of vital significance at this point are the two statements by St. Paul. And I quote, That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And he also said, First, that which is natural, then that which is spiritual. And again he says, For the natural man comprehendeth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he. You see, I told you several years ago on a broadcast of the hour of the time that St. Paul, as he is known in the Catholic Church, or Paul, as he is known in the Protestant religion, was a member of the mysteries. Everything that he wrote is written in the esoteric language. You see, if all that is true, then then man cannot comprehend the things of the Spirit of God if he is the natural man. And as Paul says, neither can he. And of course not. For if that is true, he is not yet in that higher kingdom of evolution, and he must be transformed, transfigured, lifted up into a superior world of consciousness before he can cognize spiritual things. They believe evolution will thus transform him, and nothing else will, and this is symbolized in the initiation in the Lodge, when they are symbolically suffered a death in a coffin, and then raised by the grip of the lion's paw and given a new name and thus said to be born again. Christians run around, they go to church, they become baptized, they become a member of the church. Then they fall out of grace, fall out of church, fall away from God, fall away from Jesus. And then they come back They sit in church, listen to some preacher, they get some feeling in their chest, they rise up, run forward, and they're said to be born again. Nonsense. (laughs) Absolute nonsense. The Brotherhood uses astrological bases for portraying cosmic truths. The ancients localized the birth of the natural man in the zodiacal house of Virgo, and that of the spiritual man in the opposite house of Pisces. And you're listening to WBCQ, Monticello, Maine, USA. So according to the mysteries, these then were the houses of the two mothers of life. The first was the virgin mother, Virgo, the primeval symbol of the Virgin Mary, 
thousands of years B.C., Virgo gave man his natural birth by water and became known as the Water Mother. Pisces, the fishes by name, gave him his birth by the fish and was denominated the Fish Mother. The Virgin Mothers are all identified with water as symbol and their various names such as Mary, spelled capital M-E-R-I, Mary, spelled capital M-A-R-Y, Venus, spelled capital V-E-N-U-S, which means born of the sea foam, Tiamat, Typhon, and Thaleth, which is all Greek for sea, are designations for water. On the other side, there are the fish avatars of Vishnu, such as the Babylonian Ionis, or Dagon, and the Assyrian goddess, Athergadis, was called the fish mother. Virgo stood as the mother of birth by water, or the birth of man, the first, of the earth, earthy. Pisces stood as the mother of birth by spirit or fire, or the birth of man, the second, described by St. Paul as the Lord from heaven. Virgo was the water mother of the natural man. Pisces, the fish mother of the spiritual man. And so, eventually there must be brought out an unrevealed significance of the fish symbol in the zodiac and in mythical religion. For it is of astonishing import, you see, in the mysteries, water is the type of natural birth because all natural birth proceeds in and from water, even human. All first life originated in the sea water according to the theory of evolution which came right out of this philosophy from the mystery schools preached to the world by a brother of the Illuminati known as Charles Darwin. The fish is a birth in and from the water and it stands patently as the generic type of organic life issuing out of inorganic. The fish typifies life embodied in a physical organic structure. Organic life is born out of the water and is the first birth, child of the water mother. And if organic life is in turn to become mother, its child will be mind and spiritual consciousness, son of the fish mother. In brief, water is the mother of natural physical being and organic structure becomes the later Mother of Divine Mind. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we do not tell you what to believe or how to believe it. We tell you the truth so that you can find your own way out of the darkness. 
so that you can find the truth. And so that if there truly is a light, you can determine which light is the true light. For they all say that theirs is the light. All of them. All of them. Ours is the light. I am the light. My way is the light. If you don't believe it, read it all. The way you get trapped in just one is that's the first one that anyone ever teaches you. Or someone more persuasive comes along and persuades you that they are right. The truth, I think you may find, ladies and gentlemen, is that they are all, in some aspects, right, and all, in many aspects, very wrong. You must discover what is right and what is wrong, because if you're not living your life in truth, then you are not living your life. You are living someone else's life. You're living in darkness, in lies, in deceit, in manipulation. Now, strangely enough, water is the uh, type, ladies and gentlemen, of another thing which is still more germinal of life, namely matter. According to the mysteries, matter is the virgin mother of all life in the aboriginal genesis. According to the mysteries, all things are generated in the womb of primordial matter, the old genetrics of Egyptian mythology. And according to the mysteries, it is by consideration of the nature of matter and its evolution that we are enabled to arrive at last at the true meaning of the double motherhood of life. For oddly enough, they believe matter is seen to exist in two states, in each of which it becomes mother of life at two different levels. Primordial matter, the sea of what seems to us empty space, is the first mother of all living forms. They believe that this is the primal abyss of the waters in Genesis, the source of all Darwinism. The Latin word for mother is our very word matter with one T left out, spelled M-A-T-E-R. And how close to matter is water. And organic structure is the second mother, parent of spiritual mind. All of the ancient books, ladies and gentlemen, always grouped the two mothers in pairs. All of the ancient books and the ancient philosophies said that they were called the two mothers, or sometimes the two divine sisters, or they were the wife and sister of the god under the names of Juno, Venus, Isis, Ishtar, Sibyl, or Mylita. In old Egypt, they were the first, Apt and Neith, and later Isis and Nephthys. Massey, the great esotericist, relates Neith to Net. Net. You heard us discussing the Netters the other night. Not many people upon the face of this globe understand what it was that they that we were discussing. Not many people upon the face of this earth have ever heard the name Netters as applied to a group. And it took me many, many years of study to figure out exactly who were the netters and what did it mean. Massey relates Neith to net, in effect, fish net. And in the Bible, it talks about the apostles casting their net into the sea. Clues to their functions were picked up in the great book of the dead. It says, Isis conceived him, Nephthys gave him birth, or Isis bore him, Nephthys suckled him, or reared him. The full sense of these statements was not discerned until they were scrutinized in the light of another key sentence which matched them. In the Book of the Dead it says, 
Heaven conceived him, the Tuat brought him forth. With this came the flash of clear insight into the mystery, for that which is to eventuate in the cycles of evolution as divine mind in an organic creature, man, is aboriginally conceived by divine ideation in the innermost depths of cosmic consciousness or in the purely noumenal world or again in the bosom of infinite spirit where spirit is identical with pure undifferentiated matter. Now that's a very difficult concept to grasp. But it is mirrored in the Egyptian statement that Isis conceived him. Matter, in its invisible, inorganic state, was the womb of the first conception. Isis is virgin. In effect, pure matter, our matter sublimated to spiritual tenuity. The Tuat, on the other hand, is really earth. As the type of physical matter, our matter organic, aggregated into substantial forms, called by us physical matter. It is matter as substance, constituted and existent in the visible world in structural forms. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Isis was matter subsistent as empty space, and Nephthys was atomic matter, constituent of visible structural forms. The physical world which we must now think of as floating in the sea of empty space like fish in the water, are the second form of matter, and their organic bodies of substantial matter give birth to the Logoi in the solar systems and to the Christos in man according to the religion of the mysteries. So they believe that divine spirit is conceived in the womb of Isis, the first universal mother, and brought to birth in the womb of Nephthys, the second mother, the immediate incubator and gestator of its manifest expression. So you might paraphrase this situation by saying that a human child is first conceived in the love or mind of its parents and later born from the womb of its physical mother. Thus life has two births and must of necessity have two mothers. The only problem with this is it was written when that is the purpose of sexual intercourse was to produce a child. Not so today. This philosophy would not stand up would not stand up in any single bar in this nation. Because children are conceived every day without love, without thought, without mind of its parents. And indeed, after that meeting of the bodies, in many instances the parents never see each other again in the rest of their life. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter what you believe. It's all flawed in some part. All of it. All of it because it has all been pinned by the hand of man no matter who or what inspired it. So they believe that life is spiritually conceived and materially born. Or, man may be said to be born as a natural creature from spirit into matter, and born later as a spiritual God when he emerges from his baptism in the water of the body and re-enters the bosom of his Father. Or finally, he is born first as man by water and reborn later as God by fire. And the first birth was depicted as taking place on the western side of the zodiac in the house or womb of the Virgin Mother, Virgo, because in the West, the sun, the sun, the universal symbol of spiritual fire, 
descended into organic matter in its setting or incarnation. And so they believe man is born as natural man on the west to be regenerated as spiritual man on the east. Horus, risen, the new dawn, the source of light, of knowledge, of intelligence. Spirit's descent on the west makes it man. Its resurrection on the east, like the summer sunrise, makes it deity or God again. This is the death and resurrection of the God in all religions. It is the reason for the sunrise service on Easter. It is incarnation and return to spirit. It is the descent of the Messiah into Egypt and his exodus back to Canaan. And there's more. <laughs> oh, yes. Further scrutiny of such data brings to light links of connection with the Bible. The chief one is found in the symbol of bread in connection with both Virgo and Pisces. You see, Pisces is the house of the fishes by name, but it is not commonly known that Virgo in astrological symbology was the house of bread. Virgo in astrological symbology was the house of bread. And this is indicated by several items of ancient typology. You see, many years ago, many centuries as a matter of fact, in the precession of the equinoxes, the end of the year was marked by the position of the great dog star Sirius, the mighty celestial symbol of the divinity in man in the mysteries. And precisely at midnight of December the 24th, it stood on the meridian line from the zenith to Egypt. At about the same moment, there arose on the eastern horizon the constellation of the Virgin, bearing in her left arm the Christ child, symbol of the Christhood, coming to function in man, and in her right hand the great star Spica, which is Latin for a head or spike of wheat. <laughs> As in spike training. Symbol of that same divinity coming as celestial food for man. Wheat. Bread. It must ever, ladies and gentlemen, be remembered that the gospel Jesus told us we had virtually to eat his body as food and drink his blood if we would inherit eternal life. So typism represented him as coming in the form of man, the babe Christ and as food for man, the wheat. John speaks of the Christ principle in the words, quote, This is that bread which came, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Now listen to me carefully. This is that bread which came down from heaven. That if a man eat of it, he shall hunger no more. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus broke a loaf into fragments and gave to his disciples, saying that it was his body broken for them. And then we have Virgo established as the house of bread and Pisces as the house of fish. But the characterization of the two houses must be brought along to a more specific evolutionary reference. What are these houses thus delineated? What does it mean? They are, according to the mysteries, as at first, the two states of matter. But how to be taken in immediate reference to the life of man on earth? They are in the final stage of the meaning man's body itself, which consists of matter in both its invisible and its visible forms. You see, for man has a natural body, according to these people, and a spiritual body. Man's body itself houses the two mothers. The body is this double house of bread and of fish. And the next link is seen when it is considered that this physical body is for the soul the house of death, and in its regenerative phase, the house of rebirth. And while the rose represents the soul in the ancient order, the rosi cruci, and the cross, the matter, or the body, signifying the death of the soul crucified upon the cross of matter. 
It is the house into which the spirit descends to its partial obscuration in the darkness of the grave of matter into the night of death or incarnation, out of which it is to arise in a new birth or resurrection on the opposite side of the cycle when the body dies and the soul is released from its prison of matter. A significant passage from the Book of the Dead recites, quote, Who cometh forth from the dusk and whose birth is in the house of death? End quote, referring to the incarnating soul. In a spiritual sense, the soul dies on entering the body in incarnation, according to these people, but has a new birth in it as it later resurrects from it. So the body is therefore the house of his death and rebirth or the place of his crucifixion and resurrection. And truly, upon the soul's entering a new body, upon incarnation, all memory is erased and can be said to be death. The Egyptians had a name for the body as the locus of these transformations, which carry the central meaning of all theologies. This name now rises out of the dim mists of ancient Egyptian books to enlighten all modern Bible comprehension. This city of the body, with a son of soul, spelled S-U-N, of soul, sank to its death on the cross of matter to re-arise in a new birth, was called the city of the sun or in Greek, Heliopolis. But in the Egyptian, Anu, spelled A-N-U, the name was given to an actual Egyptian city where, ladies and gentlemen, the rites of the death, burial, and resurrection of Osiris or Horus, the two are the same depending upon whether the sun is setting or rising, were enacted each year. But the name bore a theological significance before it was given to a geographical town. You see, the name is obviously made up of new, spelled N-U, the name for the mother heaven, or empty space, or abyss of nothingness, and alpha, privative meaning, as in thousands of words, not. So, capital A, coupled with N-U, would then mean not nothingness are a world of concrete actuality, the world of physical substantial manifestation. Precisely such a world it is in which units of virginal consciousness go to their death and then rise again. So all of you who think you've been born again, you haven't even begun to understand the meaning of the term. You have taken an esoteric philosophy and turned it into a literal meaning. Anu is then the physical body of man on earth. The soul descends out of the waters of the abyss of the nun in UN, our space in its undifferentiated unity, which is the sign and name of all things negative. The nun is indeed our none, spelled N-O-N-E, our nothingness. Life in the completeness of its unity is negative. To become positively manifest, it must differentiate itself into duality, establish positive-negative tension, and later split up into untold multiplicity. And this, they say, brings out the significance of the biblical word multiply. Life cannot manifest itself in concrete forms until it multiplies itself endlessly. Unit life of deity must break itself up into infinite fragments in order to fill empty space with a multitude of worlds and beings of different natures. The primal sea, or mother, must engender a multitudinous progeny to spawn the limitless shoals of organic fish worlds. This, ladies and gentlemen, in the mysteries is the meaning of the promise given to Abraham 
that his seed should multiply till it filled the earth with offspring countless as the sands of the seashore. And if life was symboled by bread as the first birth, and by fish as the second, then we might expect to find in old religious typology the allegory of a Christ figure multiplying loaves and fishes. So are you surprised to find that the Gospel Jesus does this very thing, multiplying the five loaves and the two small fishes to feed a multitude? You see, this could be astonishing enough in all conscience, but it yields in wonder to the next datum of comparative religion which came to our notice as a further tie between the Bible and antecedent Egyptian mythology. Who among you can adequately measure the seriousness of the challenge which this item of scholarship presents to gospel historicity? For a discovery of sensational interest came to light when a passage was found in the Book of the Dead which gave to Anu the characteristic designation, quote, the place of multiplying bread, end quote. And here, in the long silent tomes of old Egypt, was found the original, the prototype of the miracle of the loaves and the fishes in the Gospels of Christianity. And the meaning never before apprehended had to be read into this New Testament wonder. And at last, we were instructed to catch in the miracle the sense that the physical body, as Anu, was the place where the corpus of the Christ's deific power was broken into an infinite number of fragments and distributed out among a multitude of creatures in hungered after a three days fast or deprivation of the food of spiritual life in their sojourn in the three kingdoms, the mineral, vegetable, and animal, before reaching the plane of mind. And here are all the elements of the inner meaning of the Christian Eucharist, the broken but multiplied fragments of the body of the God distributed to feed hungry humanity. And, as humanity is composed of twelve groups of divine conscious units, there were gathered up twelve baskets of fragments. And this episode of the Christ's ostensible life is found to be Egyptian in origin and meaning and symbolic in character. And indeed, <laughs> and indeed, Christ was written about and spoken of and celebrated long before the Christ of Christianity ever appeared upon this earth. that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we're going to leave you for tonight because that gives you more than enough to think about. Now, I want to tell you once again, it doesn't matter if you believe this or not or if I believe it or not. It matters not at all. For those who have the power in the world today, believe it. They believe it. And if they believe it, it will affect all of us, whether we believe it or not. What we believe makes no difference except in our own lives, in the world, and how the governments and powers and principalities rule us or enslave us. It makes a great deal of difference.